Oh, no worries. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. How are you guys going with your streaming audio? Everything is set. You're fine. Yeah, you want to talk about it? I guess. I guess you just have to see how the map is. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see it. 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 Um, yeah, so do you actually end up putting it right here in front of the speaker. Like, it's going to be a song. Um, so yeah, we're going to fix this table here in a second. Yeah, we uh, hard until something Test, test. Test, test. Hello? Oh, it is, um, yeah, funny. Um, Somebody <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will be commencing shortly. If you have not yet had a chance to sign uh, the uh, contact tracing or the memorial book for the family, there will be time to do that um, after the service has concluded. So don't worry about that. So we will be starting shortly. And if you haven't signed, you can do that at the end. Thank you.
And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, that song had a uh, special meaning for Creighton, and uh, we will explore that a little later on. On the 23rd of March, 2017, I was visiting my son who was living in Europe. I got a message from Creighton. It was a photo of a scan and the words, look what I got for Easter. It made no sense to me whatsoever. But so started a roller coaster journey for Creighton. In one way or another, all of us have been on that journey with him. This is how 
I recall the roller coaster going. Initially, it was very bad news. Stage four bowel cancer. No chance of surgery, maybe only six months to live without treatment or 18 months with treatment. But it happened that Creighton responded very well to chemotherapy. So well, in fact, that by the end of that year, he was looking at having surgery to remove the, the tumor in his bowel. And at this point in the story, as we know, I think the day after Creighton saw the surgeon uh, who agreed to operate, Kathy unexpectedly and suddenly died. In the Creighton story, of course, this was incomprehensibly devastating. Suddenly he faced life and death and hardship alone. Creighton, however, possessed a level of courage, inner strength and resilience, which was outstanding. And he showed that all through his three and a half year journey. The next part of the roller coaster was both the grief and the joy of Charlotte's wedding without Kathy. Creighton then had successful bowel cancer. And uh, as they looked at his liver, they determined that uh, surgery uh, for his liver would be abandoned at that stage. What followed was nearly another year of chemo, effective but gruelling. The good news was that uh, after, after that year, uh, Creighton's liver was, was well enough to, to uh, have surgery. And there was the hypothetical declaration after that surgery that he was cancer-free. Sadly, that cancer-free was a short-lived period. It was followed by more chemo, by failed chemo, by the hope of being part of a clinical trial, by no further treatment, by the hope of healing, by a decline in health, and then unbelievably 13 days ago, Creighton died. That's quite a roller coaster ride. What do we make of that journey? For me, I have a deep sadness, but I find encouragement in two scriptures that are both profound and radical. And I simply say, where would we be without the hope of God's word and what Jesus has done for us? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who've fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. This verse assures us that death is not the end of the story. The great hope for all believers is the resurrection, because Jesus came back to life, so will all believers. Therefore, we need not despair. Even uh, in the tragedy of Creighton's death, because God can turn tragedy into triumph and defeat into victory. So let's comfort ourselves with this truth that Creighton stands in the presence of God safe and secure. And as Paul comforted the Thessalonians with the promise of the resurrection, so we comfort and reassure each other today with the great hope that Creighton is resurrected. This verse clearly speaks of Creighton's great hope in Christ. As he grappled with life, as he, he grappled with life without Kathy, as he endured medical treatment, and as he faced the reality of his own steady declining health, Creighton found an ever-growing hope in his heavenly home. The second verse uh, contains the words of Jesus, which he said to his disciples shortly before he died. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Jesus' promise is the way to eternal life is secure because it's secure in him. And he has already prepared that way. These verses provide rich promises. Jesus says, 
I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he says, I will come and get you. And we can look forward to eternal life because Jesus has promised it to all who believe in him. And again, we can comfort ourselves with these words that Jesus has prepared a place for Creighton and Creighton has gone to that place. We're going to sing the, the song that we, we uh, heard as the service began. It's, uh, it's called It Is Good With My Soul and Creighton particularly wanted us to sing this song uh, because of the, the story that go, goes behind its writing. It too is a tragic story. A man called uh, Horatio Spafford was uh, a, a successful lawyer and uh, tragedy struck his life a number of times. The first tragedy was the death of his four-year-old son. And then a couple of years later, in uh, 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed uh, many, uh, many houses and much of his property and his investments were lost. He planned on going to England with his family, but uh, because of, of difficulties in business, he was delayed. And so his family went on ahead of him. And whilst they crossed the Atlantic Ocean, their ship uh, struck another ship and sunk very quickly. His four daughters died and only his wife survived. She sent a, a brief telegram with two words, saved alone. Shortly after, uh, Spafford travelled to meet his grieving wife. And as he crossed the place in the Atlantic where, that, uh, where the, the ship had sunk and his daughters uh, had, had died, he, he penned the lyrics to this song. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. This is uh, Creighton's message to us, and I'd encourage you to uh, take your, your paper and uh, sing along as best we can. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll,
then my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The truth shall resolve and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Andrew, who is uh, Creighton's brother-in-law, he's going to come and uh, remind us of the details of Creighton's life. So born on the 21st of November 1965 in Parks was Creighton, eldest son for Graham and Yvonne Orr. His parents described him as a placid and content child. An example of this was when Graham took him out on the tractor one day when he was very young, he fell asleep. So Graham, father of the year, put him on a blanket in the corner of the paddock and proceeded to do a few more rounds and came back to him in an hour or so, and Creighton was still asleep on the blanket. Creighton was elder brother to Jason and Eden, and while his parents say he tormented his brothers his whole life, he was probably just doing his job as a big brother. Creighton loved anything with wheels, especially his dinky, which he rode and rode and rode until he nearly wore the wheels off it. Creighton attended a number of schools during his school years, starting in Parks Public, then Canberra, and then the family moved to Exmouth in Western Australia, and then to Yeovil, where his parents operated the local supermarket. Creighton completed Year 10 twice, staying in Yeovil to for the second attempt while his family moved to Canberra. The official reason for this second attempt was to improve his final results, uh, but was probably to do with shooting and riding more than anything else. One of Creighton's biggest fears was that the fuel crisis would end cars as we knew them and he would never get to drive. Not long after leaving school and joining the family in Canberra, Creighton joined Australia Post as a telegram delivery officer. He then became a postal delivery officer and then promoted to the dizzy heights of Relief Postie, which is apparently the elite. <laughs> Early on in his five years with Australia Post, Creighton caught bought a five litre V8 HX Prem. His mother hated it, but Creighton loved it. One of his first official motorbike races was the Pony Express event, which he won the four stroke division with his brother Eden. The last official event he raced was in 2017, the Yellow Mountain Cross Country Enduro, which although he is not able to finish, was also able to enjoy with Eden. Creighton met Kathy in Yeovil as a teenager. And then when Kath moved to Canberra to work in the bank, they met up again and finally started going out. Fast forward to 1987 and they get engaged and married on the 31st of October the same year. Kathy and Creighton moved to Dubbo in 88 and started coming to Dubbo Baptist Church. And after a short time living in a flat, they bought the house in Good Street, which they lived in for the rest of their married life. Creighton scored a very salubrious job when he first arrived in Dubbo, loading kegs and cartons into the cellar store at Sid's Bottle Shop. This job held no future, and he soon started working with Eden Tankwell. 
Most uninviting work is making fibreglass tanks, and it was here that Creighton encountered the first in a series of major injuries. While working in the shed, he was backed over by the forklift, breaking his leg. Unfortunately, the accident happened right next to the wall, and they had to drive the forklift back over his leg again to get it off him. With his leg now nailed, Creighton had a fair bit of time off work, and rather than recuperating, he rebuilt his car. A short time later, he secured a job at Western Plains Automotive, initially washing cars and chasing parts, and then he worked in the spare parts department. It was during these years that children started to arrive. Charlotte was born in 1991, and a more beautiful baby girl Creighton had never seen. William joined the family in 93, and Harry rounded things out in 95. Their little family was complete. Creighton worked hard to always provide for his family. But you could say you had a pretty calm approach to parenting. Uh, the kids knew if Dad yelled at them, it must have been pretty bad. One day, Charlotte decided to be a hairdresser like Auntie Deb and uh, cut Will's hair. Kath was furious and she was so mad. He thought, I'll show you kids. I'll take you over to your father. So she took them to work, hoping that Creighton would give them a berating. Uh, but all he did with his workmate was just laugh at them, which was not the uh, reaction Kath was looking for. After a number of years at Western Plains, Creighton took up a job, spare parts at Golden West Holden. This was not what he hoped for and in a very short time was working for Frank Armstrong Automotive. Initially employed to run the office side of things, he was not able to keep himself out of the workshop and away from cars. It was while working here that Creighton discovered the gentle art of Speedway. A powerful and seductive mistress she was and took him away from his family quite a lot. And while many years of racing was enjoyed, Eventually, Creighton abandoned this pursuit in favour of more time with his family. Yet another change took place with a job offer from Chesterfield, Australia, initially in spare parts, but eventually in sales. This there turned out to be the longest job that Creighton ever held. While often quite demanding, he found it very satisfying, especially when he was able to help a customer or solve their problems. Never one to knock back a chat or a good sticky beat, this job allowed him to do both while meeting some wonderful people. While attending a Chesterfield business function, Creighton injured his knee and required an operation to repair the damage. He occupied his recovery time by perfecting chocolate lava cake. This took him more than a week to perfect and the kids were sick of lava cake by the time he got it right. Creighton also managed to break his wrist quite badly at his nephew Ollie's Bucks party. Deciding it was time to show the young blokes how to ride properly, he took off flat out across the paddock hit a gully, spat himself metres in the air, landing on the ground, shattering his wrist, requiring more surgery in Sydney. The years with kids were full of fun and, and enjoyable. And there was always seemed to be an event of some sort at any time. Spending time with the Kinchers, Hyde Smiths, Eagles and Browns has been part and parcel of every one of these social events. A highlight was the summer holiday to Milestone on the North Coast, where half of Dubbo seemed a holiday. Life was simple, but full of family, friends and fun. The kids shared school, church and their backyards. Birthdays and Christmases were always noisy events, and trips to Nan and Pop's farm were always looked forward to. In later years, as the kids grew up, holidays changed a bit. Creighton won a cruise with John Deere, and he and Kathy sailed the Mediterranean. They then travelled to the UK and other parts of Europe by themselves. Creighton said this was one of the best things he had ever done for their marriage. They needed to rely on each other as they travelled and shared the experience of countries that they had never been to and often didn't know the language. The travel bug bit and Kath and Creighton started travelling more and more overseas. Sometimes alone, sometimes with family, sometimes with friends, but always ready to make the most of the experience. Creighton was known for his love of a good party, appreciation of a good party shirt and the irresponsible service of alcohol. His idea of a good time was making sure that you had a good time. Kathy and Creighton were very generous people and their life was full of the important stuff, the stuff that money can't buy. March 2017 came the news that nobody wants. Creighton was diagnosed with stage four liver and bowel cancer. He was given six to eight months to live with, with chemo, maybe 18. 
then began eight months of fortnightly chemo sessions, a massive amount of therapy. This was accompanied by a massive amount of prayer by our church family. Kath made sure that there were plenty of quality family and friendship times. Rather than damaging them, this became another time that strengthened Kathy and Creighton's marriage. Then while in Sydney celebrating their 30th anniversary and attending some medical appointments, Kathy suddenly died. This turned Creighton's world completely upside down. From time to time, Yvonne would leave her life in Ballina and come to Dubbo to care for Creighton. William and his girlfriend Charlotte moved to Dubbo and cared for Creighton for four or five months. This could have been a time to give up, but Creighton pushed on. He had an operation in December 17. He was home for Christmas and Zach and Laura's wedding. No holiday in January 18. Back to Sydney in February for more operations. Home to recover for a month and then walk Charlotte down the aisle to marry Zach on the 3rd of March, 2018. This was a beautiful day with tinges of sadness as Kath was not there. True to form, Creighton served the guests pizza and filled up their glasses, just like you'd always done at any other celebration. Recover, recovery was steady, and by early 19, there were promising signs of positive surgical results. By June, the bad part of the liver was removed. Unfortunately, the remaining good part had cancer spots in it. Again, this could have been an opportunity to give up, but again, Creighton pushed on. By the end of the year, he was responding well to chemo and was re in ridiculously good shape. January 2020 saw Creighton holiday up the coast with his caravan and enjoying it once again. Covered in prayer, 2020 seemed to be a good year for Creighton and the opportunity to join a drug trial appeared to be a possibility. Unfortunately, his good health did not last the whole year. And on the 17th of December, Creighton finished his fight. His last days were spent with family and friends and singing praises to God. He had no anger or bitterness, just a peace and calmness that came from the knowledge that God had all of this in control. So what of all those prayers? Where is the miracle we were praying for? We should not be blinded by our ache and loss. God has answered our prayers and done amazing things through and for and around Creighton. This year has seen Creighton in some of the best health he has experienced since being diagnosed. He has had physical and mental strength that astonished Creighton himself. We need to remember that this man, this is a man who was diagnosed with six months to live, but God saw fit to give him an extra three years. He had a bowel that should not have been working at all. Incredible liver function for almost no liver at all. And all this with little or no pain. But what was going on inside Creighton's body, this is quite amazing. It is only us now who feel pain. We love him and we'll miss him, but find peace in the fact that he is now healed and whole and in the presence of God. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer as we give thanks for Creighton's life? Father, we do thank you for Creighton, for the man that he was, for all his quirkiness, for uh, the great friend that he was, the generous person that he was. And uh, we, we thank you that our paths crossed. We thank you that we, we got to do life with him. Amen. And, Father, we would pray for those who, who are grieving that they might know your comfort. We pray for Charlotte and Zach and, and pray, Father, that you would comfort them today and in the days ahead. For Will and Charlotte, who are not here, we pray, Father, that they too might know your comfort and although half a world away, be able to, to work their way through this very real grief. And for Harry, Father, we, we pray for him again that you would help and comfort and strengthen him in his grief. And for Yvonne, uh, Graham and Deb, Father, we pray uh, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, comfort them in their grief as well. And, and Father, for Creighton's very close extended family, we pray that you would be with each one of those, that you would be their strength, their comfort, and as they lean on each other, we pray, Father, that, uh, that they would know uh, the ability to, to press forward 
confident in Creighton's presence with you, uh, confident that you are a good and loving God. And I pray, Father, that you would help all of us as we reflect on a life that has ended too soon, uh, of a man who, who lived so well. Uh, pray, Father, that we too would deal with our grief and find the resources to be better people because of Creighton's ongoing influence on our, our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's uh, my opportunity and my privilege to uh, share a few thoughts with you this afternoon. Uh, we find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be. Uh, we'd hoped that Creighton would be healed. We'd hoped and prayed that he might live a long and full life. But instead, we find ourselves here ready to bury him. And that fills us with, with so many questions, questions that we ask of, of God in particular. How has this happened? How did you let this happen? And we believe that God could have healed Creighton and we wonder why he didn't. And we wonder how we navigate through these difficult circumstances. Well, there are moments when as a pastor, I, I wish I had uh, more answers and better answers to these questions. I wish I knew the reason. I wish that God maybe would have answered differently. But if we go to the book of Psalms in the Bible, we're confronted by all sorts of questions. There, the question why, the question how long, the question of God, where are you? And sometimes we can, we can ask these painful questions, but we don't always get the answer that we hope for. But as we think and process our questions and wait on God, he changes our thoughts and, and brings our feelings to a new place. And so as we, we think, I'm reminded of uh, a song that I think puts, uh, puts it in context. In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Uh, how we might change our attitude regarding death. He says, I once scorned every fearful thought of death when it was but the end of pulse and breath. But now my eyes have seen that past the pain there is a world that's waiting to be claimed. Earth maker, holy, let me now depart, for living is such a temporary art, and dying is but getting dressed for God. Our graves are merely doorways cut in sod. And the Apostle Paul had a similar thought. In Philippians uh, chapter 1, he writes, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And they sound like such strange words, don't they? But could they be true? What if to die was gain? Does that make a difference to, to what we're doing here? Does it make a difference to the way that we think about Creighton? While he was in prison, the Apostle Paul spoke about his death. Uh, the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness to untie. <laughs> and so if you used it in a sentence, you might use it to describe loosening or unhitching an ox from a yoke or a cart. You might use it in uh, pulling up the tent uh, pegs, getting ready to travel. You might use it in untying a shock to let it sail. You might use it in de to describe unchaining a prisoner and letting them go free. Or you might use it to describe being solving a problem that's been weighing down on you.
And Paul describes death as actually being loose. And that's a very positive picture of death. Death is not a hole, but rather a doorway. It's not an end to life. The best is ahead. In 125, he was writing about Christian. Said this in the to a place for Creighton and Kathy to connect once more. I'm standing on the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails in the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She's an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and the sky come down and mingle with each other. And then I hear someone at my side saying, there, she's gone. But gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She's just as large in mast and hull and spar as she was when she left my side and just as able to bear her load of living freight to the place of destination. Her diminished size is in me and not in her. And just at the moment when someone at my side says, there she's gone, there are other eyes watching her coming. There are other voices ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. And that, for the Christian, is dying. I'm not able to answer all your questions, but I can give a, a brief description of what heaven is like. In Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throng saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I just to make a few observations from that passage. The first one being that heaven is the place where God is and that makes it a good place. It means Creighton is welcomed there by his heavenly father. Secondly, it's a place where we have a brand new body. Creighton has a cancer-free body, a healthy body, a well body, a body that is immortal and will not wear out. The third thing is uh, a similar idea that, uh, that the Apostle Peter wrote. He said, but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Well, there's much that we don't know about uh, the new heaven and the new earth. Peter tells us that it's the home of righteousness. And it's very hard for us to imagine a world with justice and righteousness and to know what that would be like. It would be a place there where there was no lying or stealing or violence or bombs or sexual assault. It would be a place where there is justice for all. You probably say you don't have enough time or enough money or enough energy, but really what this world lacks is justice and righteousness and Creighton is in a place where that is in abundance. And so I think it brings us back to the words of that song to explain the hope that Creighton lives in. In the old rugged cross, Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. And that is what Creighton has done. Would you pray with me? We thank you, our gracious Father, for your comforting presence here. We thank you for wrapping your arms of unconditional love around us 
and filling us with your peace. We thank you, Father, for accepting Creighton into your heaven. And we thank you for the comfort and strength that you give in such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God in his great mercy to receive to himself the soul of our dear friend, Creighton, we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you in the midst. Sadly, unfortunately, there is uh, some COVID announcements that I need to make. Uh, there is a memorial surf service at uh, Dubbo Baptist Church this afternoon, but due to COVID restrictions, that is by invitation only. Uh, if you go to uh, Dubbo Baptist Church website, uh, you'll find a picture of Creighton, and if you click on that picture, it will link you to that service. Uh, also, uh, for our time here, uh, if you didn't sign uh, the register coming in, please make sure you do that before you leave. It is essential for COVID purposes. There is a, a record of your attendance here today and uh, Abby staff will, will assist you in that. Uh, if uh, you wish to, as we conclude, uh, there's an opportunity to put some gum, gum leaves on Creighton's car. I made a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm down. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart how precious did that grace appear the Sing God's praise, then 